The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 8 and verse 30. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Our Justification. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We pray thy blessing upon us in this hour, and ask thee to use thy word to thy glory, to reach the hearts of men and women who are in need, for those that are groping their way out of a life of self into a life of the Spirit. Bless each word and use it to thy glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We're studying together in the eighth chapter of Romans and come in the 30th verse to that clause, and whom he called, them he also justified. We have been studying for several weeks in this great chain of supernatural events, this chain of sovereign grace. And the next link now concerns the recording of our redemption in the eternal books of heaven. For we were foreknown in the eternal decree of God. We were predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And then we were effectually called. Now, answering to the calling as it takes place on earth in the heart of the individual believer is our justification, which takes place in heaven as God counts us perfect in Christ. All of those who are effectually called are justified. Now, we will not go into the subject at any great length at this point, since the whole nature and process of justification has been treated in earlier chapters of the epistle. It might be well to refresh our minds, however, concerning the nature of justification. Justification is entirely a divine work. If there is to be any argument whatsoever as to the place of a supposed free will in the life of an unbeliever, it must be placed at the link of the effectual calling. When we reach the question of justification, the matter is entirely out of human hand. If we remember the sweep of the divine logic in the unfolding of our salvation, as it is recorded in the earlier portions of Romans, we will recall that it runs as follows. Man was completely ruined in sin. He did not have a partial fall, but fell all the way, even to total depravity. Now, total depravity does not mean that there is no good in man but that there is no good in man that can satisfy God. There is good in man according to man's definition of good, but there is no good in man according to God's definition of good. Now, after the Lord proceeds at some length to set forth the total ruin of man through sin, we have the first turning point in the epistle. There is no difference. The Lord has proclaimed that all men are sinners and therefore condemned. He then announces that there is no difference between the method whereby he has declared man to be lost and the method whereby he declares some men to be justified. He is God, and therefore he makes all the rules. There is nothing outside of God by which he may be judged. Anyone who attempts to criticize God is really proclaiming himself to be God and therefore capable of passing a divine judgment. Any such attempt will be roundly condemned in the day when God shall bring to light the hidden things of darkness and uncover all of the thoughts of men. One of the most important theological truths which man can learn is this which we have just set forth. There is no difference between the method whereby God declares a man to be a sinner and the method whereby he declares some men to be justified. It pleases him to declare some men to be righteous and therefore he declares that they are righteous. This declaration has nothing whatsoever to do with the character of the individual whom he thus declares justified. For human character is based on human standards of comparison, and God cannot see any difference between human goodness and human badness, both of which are evil when compared with his own essential holiness. And certainly no man can say that God acts arbitrarily. To act in this fashion is to act without sufficient reason. But all reason is to be found in God. To act arbitrarily is to act unconstitutionally. But God is above all constitutions, answerable to none. The inscrutable wonder of our salvation is that God, for reasons known only to himself, 
has planned the whole redemptive sequence, passing through the death and resurrection of Christ and culminating in the incomprehensible wonder of our union to Christ, made like unto him forever. Now in justification, God records in heaven that an individual whom he has previously chosen for salvation, planning that he should be like Christ, has been effectually called and is now spiritually alive through the redemptive process. Now it's evident when we understand the true nature of justification, we will realize that in his sight we have been declared to be perfect and that there could be no possible change in him and that therefore we are perfect in him forever. The few moments that we must live on this earth until we have cast off the body of this flesh in order to enter into the practical reality of that divine perfection should not take such importance in our thinking that we should doubt what he has really declared us to be. We are like Christ in his sight, even though in the outward appearance there is a long way for us to go. Any improvement in our lives is merely catching up with that which God has pronounced to be the divine fact concerning our being as he looks upon us through Christ. In his dying moments, David said a beautiful thing about the covenant of God, which has been obscured by the very poor translation which we have for the words in our authorized version. The Hebrew, rightly translated, reads, Is it not so with my house before God? For he has made with me an everlasting covenant, with all points in order, and offering full security. Will he not make all my salvation and all my desire to grow? That's in 2 Samuel 23, 5. Now how could it be otherwise with God? Could he ever make a promise that did not have all points in order? Could he have conceived a plan that did not offer full security? Thus it is that the grace of God is brought to us in spite of what we are in ourselves. We are not considering the human aspects of our salvation at this point. We have looked at some of them as we considered the outward call of the sinner. Suffice it to say that as God effectually calls us and writes us down in his books as justified, we are made alive in Christ. Our call, as it is put in 1 Corinthians 1.9, our call is into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And no one who has been called into that fellowship can fail to know it and to enter into the transforming power that flows from it. Thus it is that we know in ourselves that we are saved, as Paul writes to the Thessalonians, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and in much assurance. Justification is a term that belongs, in one sense, to a court of law. If we consider the procedure of a trial before a high court, we will readily see that there are certain elements of procedure. There is a judge who is in charge of all that goes on in the court. There is present the invisible law by which all is directed. There is the prisoner at the bar whose future is in jeopardy. There is the lawyer for the defense who has come to his side as his advocate. There is the witness who testifies. There is the verdict which decides the case, and there is the result of carrying out of this verdict. Now, in the Bible, there are seven verses which describe justification in seven different ways. When we compare them with the procedure in a court of law, we will discover that every one of the law's procedures has its parallel in our judgment and in our justification. First, we read in Romans 8.33 that we are justified by God the Father. He is the sole judge in the Supreme Court from which there can be no appeal. Therefore, when we are justified by him, our justification is secure. There is no higher court that can overrule his decree and proceed further against us. Secondly, we're justified by grace, as we read in Romans 3.24. This is the divine principle that dominates all the process of our salvation even as the Constitution of the United States hovers over all court procedure in our land. God cannot act in any way that is contrary to his nature. 
and his nature is that of love and grace in the framework of his justice and his power. Thirdly, we are justified by Christ. He is the Redeemer who has come into the court and paid the fine, thus satisfying every demand of the all-righteous judge. Now, it's interesting to note this, that in a human court, if a man is fined $50 for some infraction of the traffic laws, the court does not care who pays the fine. As long as $50 is paid, they're perfectly satisfied. But if it's a court of murder, and if a man is convicted of having killed someone, the law will not permit a substitute. But the amazing thing that is in the court of God is that God treats the matter of our death and that God treats the matter of our justification exactly as he would treat any other sin. He will accept a substitute for us and will send Jesus Christ to die for us. And the price is paid. And that is why in the fourth place, it says in Romans 5, 9, that we are justified by his blood. This is the price, the fine that was paid. In Leviticus 17, 11, it says the life of the flesh is in the blood, for I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul, for it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. And thus it is that God tells us that our salvation is by the pouring out of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in the shedding of his blood. Fifthly, we are justified by the Holy Spirit. As I studied this, it gave me considerable pause. For the Holy Spirit, I wondered how he could be the justifying one. But then I understood that finally the Holy Spirit is the one who comes into our guilty hearts to tell us that in spite of all that we know ourselves to be, the judge has placed the burden of our guilt and our sin upon our substitute and that we may trust in him and know that we are justified indeed. Can you imagine a man who knows that he was guilty of murder sitting in the seat of the accused? He has looked up as he has been waiting weeks and weeks for his trial, he sees the door that leads to the free outdoors. He looks at the other door by which he has come in and out into his trial. And he thinks to himself that he will go back through that narrow door and be taken into the locked van and moved to the place where they shall take his life. He never expects to have his liberty again. And then suddenly someone comes and tells him that he has been freed. He sits there almost dazed. He cannot even think of the fact that he has been freed. And then suddenly the witness is able to convince him. The testimony is correct. The chain is taken from his hand. The door lies open before him. And he stands up and moves toward the door. And that's the illustration of the sixth factor. We are justified by faith. For our position is like that of the man on trial. We know that we were condemned, that we were guilty. And suddenly we learn that God has not counted our guilt against us, that he has put it upon Christ. And in answer to the effective working of the witness who has come to dwell within us, we are made aware of the presence of the new life that is ours in justification. And we believe that our Lord Jesus took our place on the cross and that God is perfectly satisfied with what he did there for us. It's our belief in that fact that God is satisfied that causes our lives to be filled with peace and assurance. And in the seventh place, the result of all the preceding factors is that we get up and walk out of the court of an evil conscience into newness of life, and our faith is proved by our works. And thus it is, as James puts it, that we are justified by works. Oh, that we might understand this, carry it back to the figure of speech that I've been using. Here you are sitting in the condemned man's seat, your trial has been going on for weeks. You know that you're guilty and you can hardly credit your ears that somehow you have been freed. But when the news finally penetrates your heart, you begin to walk first slowly perhaps and then with more rapid step as you go through the open door into the freedom that you had thought you would never see again. Thus our works are a proof of the fact that the Holy Spirit has whispered to our heart that we are justified, and our works are the proof that we believe this and have been justified. This whole series of steps of justification is beautifully illustrated in one of Charles Wesley's famous hymns. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me, who caused him pain? 
for me, who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And then there's that great third verse. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Now the theological order is beautifully followed in this hymn. For here we see all streaming to us from the grace of God, brought to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, made possible through the shedding of his blood. Then, when the sinner is bound in sin and nature's night, the effectual calling takes place. The quickening ray comes from God. It is then that the sinner wakes, and not before. The immediate result is a chain of Christian works. There is freedom from bondage. There is the liberty of the heart. And the child of God, thus freed, goes forth to walk as a justified man. But there is more to justification than all of this, great as it is. Many of our ideas have come to us through the influence of men of the past who looked at the gospel through the eyes of their special interests. Calvin, for instance, was a lawyer, and all of his work was colored by that fact. His theology might be called a forensic theology, and he, along with Luther, was a party to dragging the law back into Christianity when Christ had come to fulfill it so completely that it would never have any further effect upon the life of a believer. Anselm lived in the age of chivalry, and all he could think of in connection with the atonement was that Christ was the knight without fear and without reproach who had come to take up the cause of God's damaged honor and to die as a satisfaction paid to that damaged honor. This is also true, but it's only a very, very small part of the whole. I was once asked to give a definition of preaching, and I replied that preaching is the bringing together of all of the experiences of life and learning to illuminate the gospel. And I believe that this definition is true. But if it is scrutinized closely, it can be seen that there is a danger in the practical application of this truth. If a given congregation heard no explanation of the gospel beyond that from a preacher who was a farmer, they would probably come to understand all of the allusions to sowers, wheat, tares, gardening, the grafting of the vine with new branches, and the other agricultural passages in the word of God. But such a minister might well leave his congregation in ignorance of many phases of the Bible which he would not be fitted to understand. There must be much more than a man's life and learning if we are to come to the full knowledge of justification, for example. Another pitfall is that we must not read the Bible with no more than a desire to find the passages that meet our needs for daily warfare. If the Bible becomes no more than an arsenal, then a Luther can be in the darkness about certain phases of truth. He, for example, was so much at war against the practice of his day which made it possible for a man to pursue the buying of salvation by money, that he could see nothing other than salvation by grace alone. He refused even to believe in the inspiration of the epistle to James, called an epistle of straw, because it seemed to him to contradict the doctrine of salvation by grace alone. Oh, if he had only been able to have a more rounded view of all the divine revelation, he would not have fallen into this error. Now, I, I've spent much of my life studying history, and I find myself looking at the scriptures through the eyes of a historian. I can see the errors that some of these men make and try to avoid them. But at the same time, I see the need of walking very humbly before God and before men, lest I create some blind spot and fail to see all that is in the word of God. Now, do not think I am refusing any of the concepts of the atonement which have been set forth by men whom I have mentioned. I believe that Anselm was correct, and that the death of Jesus Christ, which brings our justification, was indeed the satisfaction made by the Lord Jesus Christ to satisfy the sin-damaged honor of a holy God. I believe that Luther was correct, that our justification is by grace, apart from the works of the law, and that we must ever believe in salvation by grace alone. 
I believe that Calvin was correct in presenting a high view of the sovereignty and majesty of God and that we must understand the atonement in the framework of the courtroom and the release of the prisoner who has been redeemed by the fulfillment of all of the demands of the law and the justification that flows out of such a legal payment. And I believe that Wesley was right in attacking the evils of his day by a presentation of justification that had to be witnessed by the good works of the man who was justified. It was the fresh burst of the overflowing life of the Holy Spirit that made Wesley see justification as something that had to be maintained by the walk of the believer. Now, when we live in the Word of God, we will find that all of these concepts are true and that we have been justified by the great surrounding work of God, which penetrates to every phase of need and satisfies all our deepest longings. And while we wait for this accomplishment of all our desire in Christ, we will rejoice that we have been permitted to catch the glimpse of Christ as he has justified us. I will never be able to look through your eyes, and you will never be able to look through mine. But I know that I can look through the word of God, and I will hope to see some of the things that multitudes of believers have already looked upon with joy and glory. Wesley said in another verse of that same hymn, "'Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. Tis mercy all, let earth adore, and angel minds inquire no more. Ah, that's it, mystery all and mercy all. Mystery and mercy. And we can be thankful that we have more than angel minds, and that we are permitted to explore both now and forever. For this is life eternal, that we might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And while we wait, we will have no subject more vast than that which says, whom he called, them he also justified. And we ask thee, dear Lord, to bless the truth to each heart in this hour. We give thee the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.